Well, hello, and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV video. I'm joined today by Chris Althaus, the Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association CEO. Welcome to the program. G'day, Alex. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Now, Chris, early next year, you'll be ending an incredible 16-year tenure as the CEO of AMTA. Now, you started in January 2006. This is, it sounds a bit like this is your life. <laughs> but you started in January 2006, which predates the iPhone by a year. And, you know, in your time, you will have seen the incredible evolution of the smartphone, the tablet, 4G networks, now, of course, 5G, and the Internet of Things and so much more. So without yet telling me what's the most exciting thing, I'll ask you that in a sec, but what have been some of the highlights and lowlights over the past 16 years? Well, I think the highlights have definitely uh, been, Alex, the, the just the relentless emergence of, of the mobile ecosystem. Mm. But even more importantly, what I like to describe as the sort of the ultimate marriage. Um, there's, there's never been a technological marriage like the marriage of mobile to the internet mm. um, and the birth of mobile broadband, the ability to access the, the app environment and the service environment anytime, anywhere, with the sort of bandwidth that has really added incredible utility to what we do in our everyday lives. And now that might be how we bank, it might be just how we send images and videos to family and friends, uh, it might be our medical uh, consultation diary, etc. But it, it really has become that um, most pervasive and ubiquitous of, of living tools, our personal epicenter, if you like. Um, and that's been a tremendous thing to watch emerge uh, over, the, over the years. Yeah, I know that uh, things like video conferencing used to just be science fiction. We saw it in movies. And now, of course, it's science fact. And even though AT&T is supposed to have d demonstrated something like that at the World Fair in 1956, I think, if memory serves. But, you know, it takes a long time sometimes for these things to come to life. I remember using a Nokia N95 and trying to use it the way you use an iPhone today. I was doing Gmail and reading the newspaper, but you had to push buttons and it was very slow. And we even had some false starts with the Palm Pilot, which had a growing app ecosystem during the 90s. But it was just before we had, you know widespread, fast broadband networks that we have today. And so, you know, all of the things that, I mean, kids grow up today and they have all these things. We grew up, we didn't have these things and we've seen the evolution and we really appreciate it. I wonder if some of the young people really appreciate it. But what has been the most memorable and decisive thing to have happened over the last 16 years? Look, that's a really hard question because the mobile environment's been so dynamic. Mm. Um, it's moved so relentlessly and it's ever-changing and it remains that way today. Mm. Um, but I think if I look back, when we started a research program at AMTA, we, we were convinced that we needed to tell uh, the, our stakeholders, governments, uh, our customers... Uh, more about the impact of the technology. Um, so we started a research program that looked at uh, not only the impact and the size of the mobile sector and and what we did as a sector, but the the flow on effects, mm -hmm. the the enabling capacity of the technology to to make life easier, to add productivity to to uh, all sectors. And and we'd started a research program that that looked at that. And of course, surprise, surprise, we found the the, the uplift uh, in GDP, the, the productivity gain from the technology uh, was greater than the, the, the contribution of the, of the sector itself. Now, at that moment, we were the, the uh, somewhat of a lone voice. We were sort of saying to everybody who would listen, mm. you know, this is an incredibly important technology going forward. It enables productivity, it enables connectivity, and it's going to be more and more important as time goes. Well, the really big important turning point for me was when we stopped having to say that, mm. uh, when government itself was saying that, um, with other with other people saying, you know, we've, we've looked at this mobile technology and it really is going to enable our future. Um, we, uh, we we thought as, a, as, a, as an industry and as an association that that was a, a really important turning point when other people kind of got our agenda and were prepared to represent it uh, in their own right. Mm. 
What's the short version of how you got the job to be the CEO of Amta? You, did you see a, an ad in the paper? There wouldn't have been mobiles back then, I guess, the way we know them today. What's, what's the short story there? Look, uh, I was approached. I was, uh, I was a chief executive of, a, of um, the, the peak industry body for the uh, road transport and logistics sector. Mm-hmm. And um, a knock on the door uh, or a phone call, um, uh, look, there's a role coming up. Do you, uh, you're interested, etc. And and I've, I've always had this interest in technology, um, and uh, without having a lot of experience in the sector um, at all, um, the the world of mobile was immediately attractive. So, you know, one thing led to another, and and uh, in 2006, uh, I uh, I sat in the chair for the first time and uh, and started what has been a, a tremendously exciting journey. Uh, we were just launching 3G when yeah. I joined, and um, you know the 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 environment of of mobile data was just sticking its 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 head, head up. above um, the parapet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just sticking its head above. And we got into all of the the new uh, manifestations of what was going on. Uh, we discovered the 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 not so uh, happy world of bill shock. Yeah. Um, um, and we we discovered that uh, people would uh, subscribe uh, to a ringtone that they quite liked, only to find that they would get a ringtone every month mm. um, for, a, for an extended period. And there was a learning curve uh, for all of us mm. um, as we navigated that journey. Now, one of the things that uh, has been constant, I guess, in all that time is that Telstra has had the biggest network. There, We see that again today with 5G, where they've got uh, currently 41% of the places that they cleverly put as, be- as places that you work uh, live and um, travel through, <laughs> which is a clever way of, of making it sound bigger, I guess. And they talk about how by the middle of next year, they'll have 75%. And look, I've, I'm living in Canberra. I've been in Sydney. I've been on the Central Coast. I've been in Batemans Bay. And, uh, you know, in, in, in all the major areas that I've centres that I've been to, 5G is there. In fact, I've even noticed that 5G has a dirty little secret whereby the upload speeds are a bit slow. And when I, when I compare it to 4G, I can get faster upload speeds sometimes on 4G. But a, a lot of these things will... Um, smooth out and 5G will get faster as, as it's in more places. But look, I've used 5G on iPhones, Nokias, Huawei's, Pixels, uh, on uh, hotspots, 5G hotspots, and on the Telstra and Vodafone networks. And I've been able to get up to 500 megabits, which is pretty impressive. 4G sort of maxes out at about 300. And uh, last week on Commswire and ITWire, you published an exclusive article on 5G and the, the 5G revolution. So what were the most important points that you made concerning 5G and the future? Well, I think uh, once again we're 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 seeing this uh, spread of the influence of mobile and mobile broadband um, into particularly industries, and I think this is the the, the quantum shift. Five um, G is going to be uh, an enabling technology. Well, all the other generations have been enabling, but when we look at uh, industrial applications, the birth of the industrial internet and the, the, the value add that can take place in all sectors of industry, be they agriculture or health or transport and logistics, uh, the financial sector, we're, we're going to get more and more of that, um, that mobile influence. And it's the latency impact, it's the, it's the capacity and speed. Plus, when you, when you go to that core differentiator of network slicing with 5G, you, you see the capacity of the of the networks to deliver very specific solutions mm. um, to a wide range of, of applications and, and industries. And I think this is where we're, we're going to see um, huge productivity gain. Uh, it's going to challenge us in terms of how we manage employment because it will change the nature of work in many respects. We've already seen the, the work from home phenomenon during the COVID pandemic. Mm. Um, but 5G is going to enable all of these things and, you know, there will be uh, important productivity gains to come uh, when you look at the stresses on economies both here and around the world as a result of COVID. Everyone's looking for a productivity uplift mm. and 5G is going to be one of the technologies, if not the central technology, yeah. um, to, to really deliver that uplift because you can get such capacity, such speed and the, the, and the all-important ingredient, mobility. Now, this sort of, sort of happened before 5G was around, but a, a good way of looking at the latency issue is when you use Uber, you know, you see the little car 
smoothly traveling down the road towards you. I mean, I'm sure a lot of that's just trickery, but, um, you know, and programming to make it look smooth. Because when you use one, three cabs or years ago, I remember using the silver service app, you'd see it sort of jump and jump and jump mm. and jump. And you, and, you know, just having that smoothness really makes a difference. And clearly that's, you know, that very low latency of 5G is going to deliver that for everything in our life. It's going to smooth everything over. But, you know, with all the talk about 5G, I've already seen 6G conferences, 6G associations. I mean, you probably talked about 6G to some degree already in AMTA, but when do you think it will arrive? How do you think it will improve on 5G? And obviously, we're not expecting Star Trek style teleportation as yet. We might have to wait for 8G or 9G for that to come first. But, um, you know, what is the industry expecting to deliver with 6G? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I think the important thing is you, we look at 5G and it, it will go down uh, in our, our uh, next phase of history as probably the most rapidly adopted of all of the generations and perhaps one of the most rapidly ad- ad- adopted technological advancements uh, uh, in a generation. Hmm. 5G is going to lay the platform. It is a different platform to what we've had before. It will take mobile connectivity into into industry it will enable that fourth industrial revolution as we say um, but inevitably the evolution moves on and you're quite right 6g will uh, eventuate um, and i think uh, the early stages of 6g if we uh, consider where we're at right now we, t- we talk a lot about intelligent connectivity and i think more and more of the intelligent aspect more and more of the smarts uh, will be built into networks networks will be um, uh, a much more active component of the uh, of the entire equation um, and then you look at the role of the handset um, and i think 6g will, will will bring in a much more dynamic wearables component i think that's uh, an aspect of our technology that is set for uh, an incredible uplift um, we're also going to continue to see this amazing um, industrial development and that will be smart vehicles, it'll be smart homes and cities um, at a level we haven't yet seen uh, because of the speed, because of the connectivity, uh, huge growth in the internet of things, all of these aspects, uh, Alex, are going to just continue this trend. But I think you'll find that the intelligence within the network uh, is the big ticket item uh, in the next generation. Yeah, and look, that intelligence in the network, being able to have devices that don't have to go all the way to the cloud in terms of, you know, in, into data centres in other countries. We only saw last night as we were recording this interview that Google had an outage and G- Gmail was down, YouTube was down, Google was down. There were tweets from people saying, I'm sitting at home and my, my Google Home powered home is not working. <laughs> I have to download the app to be able to turn the light switch or I have to get out of my chair and flick the switch. And so to be able to have a technology that can create its own meshes that talk to other devices without necessarily having to deal with towers, to have technology that can give you the cloud computing power but in uh, the devices that are in your hand in your own home, that I think is going, you know, I mean, we always go through centralization, decentralization, but it's only now that we're getting technology that can be, and it's only in the last couple of years that we've had devices that can finally do um, transcription on the device and not have to go to the cloud to get that accurate level of transcription that we're all used to. So hopefully 6G and 5G brings that as well. Now, onto the important questions, and I say it with a smile. Are you an iPhone or an Android person? And which, which, is, your, um, which is your choice of provider for internet at home, just so that uh, I'll say first, I'm an I'm an iPhone person first and foremost. I do have Android device. I've got all the devices as my job. And at home, I'm using Transact on iInet. Uh, I'm not actually on the NBN yet. Although, if uh, the government wants to come and uh, upgrade me to fiber, then I'd certainly be interested in in doing that as as to their plan and paying the extra money. Especially seeing as we now see people like Aussie Broadband offering gigabit services for 150 bucks a month, way cheaper than it used to be. So, over to you, iPhone or Android, and who's your provider? It could be in uh, a bit a bit a bit of everything. Yeah, uh, Alex, um, <laughs> I've used both. I'm currently using Android. Um, and uh, as, as a, uh, uh, someone who represents the entire industry, I've used them all. Yeah. Um, 
uh, over time and, uh, and, and had a good experience on all occasions. Um, I'm currently using Telstra. Um, I have used Vodafone now TPG and I have used Optus in the past. Um, and right now I am a mobile person through and through. Yeah. Um, I have a very great uh, advantage of, of living in Canberra in a sense and I'm, I have a 5G base station not far from me and I did a speed test recently um, on my device and I was getting 750 megabits down. Wow. Um, now that is an extraordinary speed uh, in a mobile uh, space and um, so it, it really does underscore the quality of the industry in this country. Um, it's any wonder uh, for six years running, uh, we've placed number one out of the GSMA Mobile Connectivity Index, which looks at 160 odd nations around the world. Yeah. Um, we've got a superb uh, network infrastructure um, and a government attitude to mobile, which is uh, interested, but not sufficiently interventionist to slow us down. So, you know, I've, I enjoy uh, all of the, uh, all of the providers. Um, uh, so there you go, uh, Alex, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> Very diplomatic. And I'm the same. I have uh, services on Vodafone, Telstra, Optus, and regularly using all sorts of different uh, connectivity. It, like you, it's my job. So what will you be doing after you leave AMTA? Will you take some time off? Uh, will you go into retirement? Or do you already have another position lined up? Well, first and foremost, it's it's taking some time off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you you uh, you live roles like this, um, and it's been an absolute honour uh, and a, and a privilege to to represent the sector and and uh, live the three generations that I've been involved with. But some time off, um, but it's not retirement in a sense. I, I'm not. Uh, I don't have another role to go to. But um, uh, look, if there's an opportunity to uh, to use the experience um, expertise that I've gathered over the journey uh, somewhere else. Um, then I'm open, but uh, it's it's not a hunt for a new role. Um, it's uh, it's a taking some time out, and then we'll just see what happens. Sure, sure. Well, if you ever have more observations to share, uh, you know, at ITY and Comswire, we'd love to publish them. So don't be a stranger in that regard. Uh, after 16 years, you would have great experience and great insight. So don't let it go to waste, <laughs> which I'm sure you won't. Now, I always like to. Get, as we get towards the end of the interview, ask three questions. And one is about the future. And, you know, we've already spoken about 6G and joked about teleportation. But where do you think the global communications um, industry is heading by 2030? You know, provided we haven't, there aren't more viruses or economic meltdowns or global wars. And, um, you know, I often wonder about brain chips and accessing the internet directly through one's you know, neural network. So what do you sort of see happening over this next decade? Well, I think one thing that the past has taught us is that we've got an insatiable appetite now for data. Hmm. Um, so if you combine the capacity of analytics and the, and the way that we are uh, manipulating data, data, learning from it, uh, and you add that to the connectivity through, through networks, uh, and then you apply the the magic source of of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Um, you really have that DNA, if you like, of uh, maximising the, the advantage of, of Industry 4.0 uh, agendas. Now, that's just the start. And if you think back, and I often look for examples in technology, you look, at, you look back at the start of 4G and people said, you know, the, the, the resolution on the screen is not good enough to watch long form content on this size device. So that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, that's, that has completely uh, been <laughs> proved incorrect. Yeah. Not only do we, do we consume media, but we, we actively share it. Um, now, if you look at the speed of that transition and then apply it out to 2030, when we get to 2030, of course, uh, 6G will be well and truly on the horizon. And I think this, this role of intelligence within networks uh, and this ability to, um, to learn from what uh, data has, has uh, provided is going to be the, the, uh, a phenomenal opportunity. Um, and it will apply everywhere. Uh, we, we speak often about autonomous vehicles. We speak often about uh, real-time monitoring of health. Um, and some of these things are already 
starting to be in play now. But if you if you take it to the next level, um, not only is it intelligent, it's real time, it's anywhere, anytime. Uh, that combination is just completely be- compelling. Um, and of course, we will use that combination to solve some of the big issues um, uh, on our planet. Uh, we, we've got to generate 70% more food by 2050 mm. to feed the population. Technology is the key to that. Uh, we have major climate issues to solve. Technology will be the key to that as well. Mm. Energy efficiency, water utilisation, no matter where you go, it's going to be technology and mo- mobile technology largely combined with the power of the online environment that is going to lead us to solutions to some of these huge societal problems, quite apart from the productivity and, and economics. So it's an exciting future, Alex. We're going to uh, sit and watch things uh, happen, the likes of which we've never seen before. Absolutely. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, we didn't take the mobile phone uh, advances that we take for granted today. And uh, in, in 10 years, all the autonomous cars, or all the things we spoke about will just be taken for granted by everybody because they will have finally matured to a degree that we can trust it and, and we use it. So my second last question is always to simply ask if you could please share some of the best advice or pieces of advice that you've received in life to help you get where you are today. Really early on, um, uh, I had a mentor um, and uh, he, he said, always mistrust when you're most comfortable. Um, and I've always had that in the in the back of my mind because dynamics in industries and employment in your in your personal life are, are, are going to happen uh, whether you like it or not. Um, but at those moments when you're the most comfortable, I think it's always good to look for the next dynamic, um, the next moment of change. It's why I've enjoyed the Ampter role so much. Um, mobile has been such a dynamic space um, over 15 years, which is a long time in any role. Mm. Um, but over 15 years, it's it's never been the same. The issues have some similarity, but the, the, the meteoric progression of this technology in the period where I've been privileged to be involved is, has been phenomenal. Um, so that's an example of keep with change, look for change, embrace change is one of the things that I've always uh, taken on board as, as part of how to, how to run your life. Yeah, well, that's great advice. I mean, you, you look at someone like Nokia, who in 2006 was on top of the world, and by 2012 or thereabouts, they were taken over by Microsoft, and then they disappeared, and now they're, they're reborn as a new company, doing very well, mind you, but, I mean, they had to go through that whole Phoenix thing first, and I guess they were very comfortable, even though they tried so many different form factors and it almost got there with their little internet tablets. But, you know, I remember saying at the time, why didn't you build a phone into this? And they, they couldn't answer. They didn't know why. So, yes, always reinventing yourself. It's definitely good advice. So what is your final message to ITY and CommerceWire viewers and readers uh, to the mobile telecommunications industry in Australia and to um, you know your current and future uh, customers and partners, I guess, uh, for Amter and, and for anything you could do in the future? Okay. I'd like to wish everybody uh, the, the very best. We've had a horrible time in 2020 in many respects. We've we've had a year like no other. Um, we've we've had the challenges of, of, of the pandemic. Um, and in many ways, that uh, has pointed to this technology technology-laden future. It's it's how we've coped with COVID, um, and I think it's going to be uh, such an important part of, of the future. Um, so stay the course, IT Wire and Comms Wire. You do a great job uh, in, in, your, in your niche. Um, this part of how we run our economy and our society is only going to be more and more important. So the ability to deliver the message is going to be down to people like yourselves, um, so keep doing it, and uh, to all my friends and colleagues in the industry, bat on. Keep uh, keep the faith and keep pushing the uh, the boundaries because uh, they are going to be so important to our future. Well, Chris Althaus, the CEO of the Australian Mobile Telecommunications Association, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the last 15 years. It'll be 16 years next year. We'll try and have a chat with you just before you go, but uh, 
have a, a, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And let's hope 2021 is spectacular for us all. Thank you again. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye.